that was a blast from the past right there. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10, and if you've been with us any at all this year, you know that we're working through the gospel of Matthew, studying uh, just in order. Uh, as as it's laid out for us, and so we're in chapter 10 today. First, we'll probably look at, I think we'll probably have time today to look at the first half of the chapter, or maybe through verse 15, and so uh, what this chapter is really all about, if you could just give it a title, is, is Jesus sending out the 12, and as we, uh, you know, been studying through the gospel of Matthew, some really interesting things happen, and Matthew uh, who is Levi the tax collector, he's also called Matthew, uh, is one of these people that Jesus has called to himself, and it's later that, G- that uh, Jesus' story is being told by Matthew. Matthew's collecting all these things uh, after they've happened, and he is laying them out in a way uh, to help us come to this point of decision as well about Jesus. Is, is he Lord or is he not? And so Matthew really begins, uh, as we've studied uh, back in January, Uh, He lays out in the first couple of chapters uh, the claim that Jesus has to being king, to being Messiah. And he lays out a lot of prophecies and a lot of, uh, you know, the the genealogies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Beginning in chapter 5, we begin to hear from Jesus himself uh, at the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus begins to speak with this great authority. Uh, He begins to, to speak and to share in the presence of these crowds. He's instructing his learners, his disciples. Uh, but he's speaking in a way that has never been heard before with such authority. And then that's followed up. Matthew uh, intends for us to understand that, that after Jesus said those things, he began to not only speak with authority, he began to act with authority. And, and so when you take those things together, Jesus was teaching, he was preaching, he was healing. And you take all that together and it, it really says, here's someone you need to pay attention to. This guy uh, says some amazing things some hard-to-believe, hard-to-understand things, but yet at the same time, he's healing people. I mean, he's healing leprosy and people who are paralyzed. He's raised the dead. I mean, we really need to pay attention to what this guy's saying. And so, again, Matthew's really making this case through the whole gospel that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, the long-awaited Emmanuel, God with us. And um, so through his words, through his actions, Jesus is showing us that that's who he is. Um, so, but up until this point now, up through chapter nine, it's pretty much just been Jesus teaching and preaching and doing these miracles. It's been a, a, in a sense, a one man show. Um, it's the God man. Okay. But it's a one person show. It's, he's only physically able to be in one spot at one time. Um, and he's, um, having a, a great effect, uh, but now at the end of chapter nine, Jesus is about to transition his ministry uh, and to take it into other places by using other people. And he's going to equip them, he's going to send them out to do what he's been doing. And so this is a new phase in ministry. And so I uh, just want to look at that today. Chapter 9 ends, and it ends with, with these verses we, we read last week. It says that uh, Jesus, speaking with his disciples, his learners, He's having compassion on the crowds because they're helpless and harassed. They're without knowledge. He loves these crowds so much. He says, listen, there's there's a harvest here. There's a harvest here. He says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, what becomes obvious is Jesus is not talking about crops. Okay, he's not talking about wheat or tomatoes or beans or anything like that. He's talking about people. He's talking about souls. And he, he's saying, you know, if you just look, as he's looking at the crowds, having compassion, he's seeing them that, that there's a great potential there for a harvest of souls for this kingdom. Okay, the kingdom he's been speaking about. They're, they're, these, these people need the kingdom. They need the king. He said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. In fact, right now, it's only one, okay? It's not, not a very good, um, uh, very good plan at this point in God's eyes, okay? So notice the thing that he says to his disciples. He says, pray earnestly. 
You know, it's interesting that Jesus uh, enlists these disciples to begin praying. Now, um, there's a, I ran across this quote this week about praying. I thought it was really good. It's from John Bunyan. You know, he's the guy that wrote Pilgrim's Progress. But he says this, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. And maybe let's look at that again. He says, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. And so there's this, this kind of this idea that Jesus is, is showing his disciples that, you know, when we, we're getting ready, I mean, we see a need or we're getting ready to set out on some endeavor, we're making some kind of plans, whether they be like big or small, honestly, you know, really our first thing to do about that should be to pray. And, and I, I'm just telling you, this is an area that I, I know I need to grow in, uh, and maybe you do too, that prayer is really where it's at. If we, if we will begin with prayer, man, that just helps so much because, you know, what is prayer? We think about what, what is the point of prayer? What are, we, what are we doing in prayer? Well, several things, actually. You know, when we pray, just like Jesus is encouraging them to pray about this need, uh, sometimes we're praying about a need. We're saying, God, I need, I need your help. Like, I can't see a way forward. I, 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 need, I need help. I need your provision. I need a plan. Uh, sometimes we're praying for that. Sometimes we're praying, uh, part of our prayer is, is to be worship. We're adoring God. We're saying, man, he, I mean, you're awesome. You know, when we see him pull through in a situation, we see just how great he is. Part of prayer is communicating with God and worship. So part of it is petitioning God, part of it's worshiping God, part of it is thanking God. And, you know, Paul is very um, important to point that out. I mean, he points it out as something very important that we need to be thankful when we pray. So prayer is connecting with God, and it's, it's petitioning God, worshiping God. Uh, we, we also confess to God through prayer. Like, if I know that I've messed up in a certain area, okay, I'm still, I still stand forgiven, before him positionally, but there's an aspect to where prayer is, is, uh, is me confessing to him. You know, I mess up in this area today, and, and I'm agreeing with him. So all of that is in prayer. It's all sort of part of what prayer is, but there's something about prayer that, you know, we sort of think of it as us communicating to God like one of those four things. And God is waiting for us to do that. I mean, he is desiring for us to do that. He wants to hear from us. Um, because it's just like, you know, here, Jesus sending these guys, uh, these guys out to be laborers in this harvest. You know, God doesn't need them. He doesn't need us. But he wants us. He wants to include us in his plan. Now, that's something that I just cannot fathom. I mean, why would God want to use us? Seems like the weak link in the plan, doesn't it? But, but yet, he's relational, and he doesn't want to do it without us. But prayer is his way sometimes of enlisting us in what he's going to do. And so prayer, so we're confessing to God, praising God, petitioning God, you know, and a lot of it's communication that's going like that direction. But there's also a part of prayer where he's communicating with us, okay? Okay. And I don't mean that, okay, like God necessarily speaks in an audible voice, okay? I'm not saying that he does that. I mean, I guess he could if he wants to. But more often than not, the way that God works through prayer is that as I'm praying about a particular need or a particular situation, okay, as I come to him in prayer, what often happens is he begins to, he begins to speak not through my ears, but he begins to speak through his spirit in my heart, and he begins to change the way I feel about a situation. He changes my desire. Sometimes he motivates me to, can I say this? He motivates me to get involved, okay? And that's exactly what happen, is happening right here. These guys are praying about God's uh, sending forth the laborers into the harvest, and guess who God's going to call to be laborers in the harvest? These guys, and uh, they didn't maybe see that coming, right? Uh, so I'd like to just read this, the next, next few verses. Let's go on to chapter 10. 
and just see what happens after these guys pray. Now, we're assuming that they pray. Jesus told them to pray. We can feel fairly confident that they did that. Uh, and in verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, He called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority uh, over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Uh, it goes on to say, The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Verse 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, so I don't know if these guys saw that coming. They end of chapter 9. Jesus saying, Pray earnestly that God will send forth laborers into the harvest. In chapter 10, Jesus, it's almost like he says, Guess what, guys? Your prayer's been answered. Oh, really? Who's, who's God going to send? <laughs> He's going to send you guys. Really? I did not see that coming. You know, so these guys um, maybe not, uh, maybe did not foresee that. But that's the thing about prayer. I mean, when we seek God about a particular situation, he has a way of enlisting us uh, in participating in those things. So if we're praying for missions or missionaries, okay, I think it's reasonable to expect that if we're, if we're praying for, let's say like we just mentioned it earlier, the Wyumi, uh, the Ames, the Centers, the Povilaries. I mean, we're, we're praying for these missionaries and the, and the work that they're doing around the world. Um, I think it would be reasonable to expect that God might stir up in you as you're praying some way to get involved with those missionaries. Or maybe with missions, maybe God will stir up in your heart the desire to go to missions training or to maybe go overseas or, uh, or maybe, maybe not going overseas, but maybe supporting someone who does. Or, or maybe uh, encouraging somebody, writing them a letter, an email, a card, a uh, you know, a you know, financial contribution, whatever it might be. Uh, similarly, you know, when we pray for people to be saved, you know, expect that God might say to us, you know, well, why don't you share with them? Well, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. Well, God is just like these guys. He's equipping these guys to go out and participate in that calling. Well, when we pray about something that God is part of his plan, Okay, and he calls us into action. Okay, he will equip us for that calling. We might not feel equipped, but we will be equipped enough to do the thing that he's asking us to do. So, all that said, I want to get back to these guys for a moment and talk about their calling. And it's a little different than maybe what we've been called to today. A few similarities, uh, but it's different in some ways. So, we're going to talk today about the sending out of the 12, and uh, we'll talk about their calling, their specific calling. Uh, so today we'll look at the first two areas there, sending out of the twelve and their calling. Uh, so let's go back to verse 1 just for a moment. It says, and we read it already, it says that he called his twelve disciples. Uh, now we know from Scripture that Jesus didn't have just twelve disciples. Okay, At this moment, they, he may have only had twelve. But we do know that there were more. Jesus had dozens of disciples, um, they, uh, a lot more than twelve. Uh, but he's calling together these 12, these specific guys, and he's giving them authority. Now, we just talked a lot about Jesus' authority in the last couple of chapters that Jesus has, uh, because he is God, he has authority over everything. And so now he is giving that authority to those whom he is calling. And he's saying the same things that I did, healing the lepers, the, the sick, raising the dead, you guys are going to be able to do that as part of this calling. Uh, now, it's not the same calling that we have today. We're going to get into that in a moment. But, okay, today we don't have the same calling that these guys had in, in every aspect. Uh, they had a different authority was given to them. And they also had a different message. Uh, if you read, like, verse 5 and 6, these guys had a message uh, to share that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, that's not really our message today. So it's related Okay, but our message today is the gospel. Jesus died for you, and he died for me. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for you. 
That's our message. We've been given a message. Uh, so these guys had a message and they had authority. There's something else interesting in this in this first couple of verses. Uh, I didn't notice it at first, um, but this is the first time that these 12 guys go from being called disciples to being called apostles. It's right here. And you may say, well, what's the difference? Okay, what's the difference between a disciple and apostle? I thought it was, you know, same thing. Uh, it's actually not. Um, all disciples not, aren't necessarily apostles. Uh, the word disciple means learner. Okay, these were guys who were following Jesus. And, and from the moment that Jesus called them, they were disciples. They were learners. They sat at his feet. Um, they listened. Uh, they were trained. And they spent time with him like 24-7. 365 for some period of time uh, they did not leave him okay they they stuck with him like glue jesus got in the boat they got in the boat jesus got out of the boat they got out of the boat and so these guys were following him learning him um, but now they're being called apostles when the word apostle uh, in greek actually means one who is sent out for a purpose particular purpose so these guys are going from being learners who are sticking to Jesus like glue to being sent out away from him to do what he's been doing. So they kind of have to be the disciple first before they can be the apostle, okay? But that's what the word means. Uh, but here's really the transition point. Uh, these apostles, and we we've, we've, we've just read through the list, uh, we have Peter and Andrew, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas, Judas Iscariot. Uh, they're listed here for us, uh, and they're listed several times in Scripture. Um, and they're, they're listed in pairs. And, and the reason they're listed in pairs is because Jesus sent them out by pairs. So in this particular instance, um, so he's sending them out two by two. And he's doing that, I think, for partnership for companionship. He's doing it for accountability. There's a lot of reasons why sending these guys out individually was probably not a good idea. So he's buddying them up. So Peter and Andrew, you guys go this way. James and John, y'all go over here. You know, you guys over here, you guys over here. So six pairs of, of disciples or apostles, excuse me, are going out. Um, so these guys, I won't get too much into the names, but we know Peter and Andrew were brothers. They were fishermen. They were called probably first, uh, James and John right after them, maybe even like the same day. Uh, these were all fishermen in the town of Capernaum. So they're always listed this way, Peter and Andrew, probably Peter's probably older. James and John, James is listed first because he's probably older than John. Um, and then um, pretty much every list of the apostles, these guys are listed first, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Uh, then we go down, it says... Uh, uh, let's see, I lost my spot there. Philip, uh, Philip and Bartholomew. So Philip, we don't know much about this Philip guy. We know he's from Bethsaida, which is a town uh, there. The Nath uh, Bartholomew uh, is also is called Nathaniel. So in the Gospel of John, uh, assuming those two guys are the same, uh, he's from Cana. Uh, so it's the place where Jesus turned the water into wine. Uh, is where Bartholomew is from. Uh, Thomas uh, is, you know, we know him as Doubting Thomas was one of the 12. Uh, we know he was also a twin. And so he is the, uh, referred to as the twin in the book of John. Uh, we have Matthew, which we know is the tax collector who's writing this gospel for us. Uh, is also known as Levi. Uh, the ninth one, we have James the son of Alphaeus. Now, there's lots of Jameses in the Bible. You have to kind of keep try and keep them straight. So you got James, uh, this James, who's the son of Alphaeus. Uh, you've got James, the half-brother of Jesus. Um, and so there's uh, also the disciple number three's name is James, James, the brother of um, John. So you got a lot, three at least three Jameses right there to kind of keep track of. So, so they usually have like some identifier there. So we've got two Jameses. Uh, then we have Thaddeus, uh, who's also called Judas. It's not Judas Iscariot. It's a, another Judas. This is Judas, the son of James. 
That may even be a fourth James. I don't know. Anyway, a lot of Jameses. Uh, then we have Simon the Canaanian, who was called Simon the Zealot. Now, this guy, uh, is, he's referred to as Simon the Zealot. This guy would have been kind of like a... Um, Kind of like a terrorist, honestly. This guy, a zealot. Simon was a, uh, being he was referred to as a zealot. He was one of these anti-Rome guys that, I mean, they were like assassins. They were, I mean, they were trying to undermine like Roman occupation. And they did like whatever it would take. I mean, terrorist activity, these guys. Uh, and Jesus called this guy to be one of his disciples. It's crazy. He can use anybody, right? He can use you and he can use me. So, He's using James, uh, or excuse me, Simon. And then lastly, Judas Iscariot. He's always listed last because of, you know, his betrayal of Jesus. Um, but Judas uh, Iscariot is one of these sent out ones. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about um, the equipping of these guys. So Jesus is sending these, these 12 out with a message, and he's sending them out with authority. So he doesn't send them out without being equipped to do the job. And so uh, that's important. Um, he's calling out only these 12 for this mission. Okay? He's, if he has other disciples, he's not sending them on this mission. So it's a very specific mission. Um, I probably should say this too, you know, as we read through the Bible, I think a lot of us have kind of been trained to just Crack your Bible, latch on to a verse, and whatever God's saying, I need to do that. Okay, it's kind of how we, uh, many people have been trained to look at the Bible. You just open it up, well, that's for me. I guess God wants me to do blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, it's always good to read it in context. Um, I'll say this, this calling is not for you and me today. This is not our calling. This is Jesus calling these 12 guys, giving, him, giving them specific authority to reach a certain people group. Um, it is not the same calling that you and I have today. So who were these guys called to reach? Like if we read on, where, where are they going? It says in verse 5, he says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, uh, nor enter no town of the Samaritans. So where is he saying to go? Just to Israel. So if you and I were to pick up this verse or this passage and latch onto it, we might uh, be frustrated by the fact that, you know what, I have never been able to heal somebody with leprosy, right? And um, man, maybe we're ministering in the wrong spot. Maybe we should go to Israel. Okay, again, it's, it's all about reading it in context and understanding, you know, what the purpose of this was and uh, to whom this calling is given. So he's equipping these 12 guys to go to Israel for a temporary purpose of offering the kingdom to Israel, and they're going to reject it. And then to whom is Jesus going to offer the kingdom? To us, to the Gentiles, to everyone. Uh, and that really brings about another calling, and it's the big one. It's the one that you and I are called to participate in. Okay, w where is our calling in the Bible? Now, I think most of you have seen this before and you, you know about it, but our calling is in Matthew 28. Okay, and... This is the, the, the one where he is equipping you and me to participate in it, okay? So he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I am with you to the end of the age. So this is a different kind of commission. Okay, Jesus is sending the twelve to Israel with the ability to heal people, and the message, the kingdom is at hand. We have been given a much different commission. It's a much larger commission. It says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Okay, that word there is ethnos. It means people groups, tribes, tongues, languages. At the, all the ethnos, that's the word used for Gentiles, go everywhere, the whole world, and make disciples. What did we did we say disciples were? Disciples are learners. Are they okay? So the ministry that you and I have been called to is a teaching ministry. Do you, do you see that? So rather than God equipping us to heal leprosy or to raise the dead and to do those things, 
Jesus is equipping us today for a disciple-making ministry. So a large part of that is a teaching ministry. Okay, It's not all teaching, but God is equipping you and me today to participate in a ministry that educates and, and um, uh, teaches and preaches this message to people so as to make disciples. So it's a different type of ministry. So, But just as God equipped those guys in that moment to do the thing that they were called to, God is equipping us today to do the same thing that he has called us to. So that's the same. God is equipping them. He's equipping you. He's equipping me. Um, so I want to share with you just a little bit about that. And we're going to move on. I promise we're going to get back to these 12 guys because they, they're going to do some interesting things here in a second. But on this idea of equipping, um, you know, God is equipping you and I to take part in this commission. And he talks about it in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 and 12. And he's going to share with us exactly how he's equipping you and me. Um, and I'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, that um, it says, and he, that's Jesus, gave to the, to the church uh, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So you and I participate in a disciple-making ministry. That's what we're called to. Uh, in the way that God has equipped his body, his church, to participate in that calling is he has given us these things that you see right here. Apostles, okay, so we're reading the words of the apostles. We have the teaching of the apostles, uh, the prophets or the teachers, the evangelists, those who share the good news of the gospel. Uh, he's also given us the shepherds and teachers. Now that word right there is actually one word. It's pastor, teacher. Okay, so that's one role, pastor, teacher. So these are the things that God is equipping this body with to build up disciples with. So who is he equipping? Well, I think a lot of times if, if you talk to people, they get this idea that, well, you know, who, who are the called to ministry? And they say, well, it's the pastor. You know, that's what we pay him for. Uh, or it's the youth pastor, or it's the worship leader, or it's the missionary. Don't we take up a collection for them every once in a while? You know, we, we kind of have this vision that, you know, we, you know, we pay professionals to do that. Okay, that, you know, that's, you know, we let them specialize, and you know, we let them do it. They're good at it. Um, and that is not what this passage teaches at all. To whom is given the work of the ministry? It says... To equip who? The saints. Who are the saints? Okay. Well, I know there's a lot of mixed up teaching on this, especially from, you know, the Catholic Church where, you know, they have this whole thing about what qualifies a person to be a saint. All that aside, the word saint means called uh, like uh, a holy one, one who is set aside for a special purpose. Um, you can go through scripture and determine pretty quickly that that is talking about you. And it is talking about me. It is talking about everybody who is born again believer. Okay, when we put our faith in Christ and we uh, are born again, uh, we are a saint. Okay, at that moment, we are set apart. We are his child. We are set apart for a purpose. We are a saint, and, and the, the purpose is uh, for the work of ministry. Okay, and so the pastor teachers, the shepherds, the teachers, Okay, they're all here to equip you and me to do the work of ministry. So, again, you know, we sometimes look at these apostles and we think, oh, well, God only called 12 of these guys, and he called, you know, the professionals to do this thing. God is not calling professionals to, to be in the work of ministry. He's calling you, all right, and he's calling me. And so these are, uh, these are principles that I think um, the, the Scripture teaches very clearly. God wants to involve you in his ministry. He wants to involve Simon the terrorist and Judas the betrayer and Matthew the tax collector. Okay, he it goes above and beyond to show us that he will use anybody and he wants to use everybody. Um, and he wants to use us for the work of ministry. And he equips us to do that. 
All right, well, back to our 12 guys. We don't want to leave those guys hanging here. Let's go back and talk about uh, their ministry. So back to uh, Matthew chapter 10. So the 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two, two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So as we begin to look at, at these guys' uh, ministry and how Jesus is challenging them to go about it, um, he uh, gives them a very narrow, like a geographical region, specific abilities, specific message, um, and part of that is okay, it's a healing ministry. Now, you can imagine if you had the cure for cancer and all you had to do was just lay hands on somebody and their cancer would evaporate, okay, or their child would come back to life if you just said the word and laid hands on it. Now, you see where that would be a very valuable uh, thing to have. People would give you anything to, to have you do that. And so Jesus is very strictly charging these guys, do not charge for this. Do not acquire wealth because that, that would be a huge temptation. Can you imagine? And so don't do that. He says, you receive this gift without paying, you dispense it without paying or without charging. Um, and then he goes even further. He says, um, acquire no gold nor silver for copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, and not two tunics, not an extra pair of shoes, not an extra this or an extra that. And uh, I know with us, like when we pack for vacation, <laughs> no, we have kids, and when we, especially when we had small kids, oh my goodness, we... Whew, we almost needed like a support vehicle. Just carry all the stuff. We're going to the beach. Well, let's look and see. You know, we need the the floats and we need the buckets and we need the shovels and we need the towel. And it, it just goes on and on. Well, what if we get down there and we need this medicine or if we got to have. Okay. Jesus is telling these guys, look, I'm sending you out and I want you to take not one extra anything, nothing extra. The clothes on your back, the shoes on your feet, that's it. Do not take, don't even take money. Don't take a credit card. Because, and this is important, he says the laborer deserves his food. So back, back to our prayer for a minute. So the, they were praying for the Lord to, earnestly to the Lord, for the Lord to send out laborers into, into what? The harvest. Okay, whose harvest? His harvest. So who are they working for? They're working for the Lord. And so Jesus is saying the laborer deserves his food. So if these guys are to stockpile and prep and to take everything for every contingency and go out on the field and, and go and do this work and, and, and never be in need of anything, there's really not an opportunity there for God to show up anywhere and to provide for their needs. Okay, And that's what they need to see. So he said, don't take anything extra. The laborer deserves his food. God will show up in the moment that you need X, Y, and Z, and you will not do without. So later on, after this is over, I think it's in the book of Luke, Jesus has a sit down, like a debrief with these guys when they come back. And he said, hey, remember when I sent you out and you didn't have any money, you didn't have any shoes, you know, extra stuff and all this? He said, let me ask you, did you do without anything? Did you ever lack anything? And all 12 of them said, no, we did not. We did not lack a thing. Why? Because God is the employer in this calling, and he is providing everything that's necessary, including their food. Every contingency. I mean, these guys didn't know what might happen. Okay, they might walk five miles and, you know, break a shoe, or they might, you know, rip their clothes, or they might, you know, get to the city and they might be hungry, or they might, you know, all kinds of stuff that might happen. These guys don't know. They couldn't prepare for every contingency, but God could. And God did. And so they came out of this on the other side with a gr much greater vision of what God could do. Anyway, so don't, 
So don't charge for your ministry, he's saying. Don't stockpile, don't prep. He said, let the Lord provide. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about staying with worthy people. It was an interesting passage. It said, uh, whatever town, this is verse 11, by the way, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake the dust off from your feet, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So in those days, um, when people would travel, um, they didn't have, you know, motels and hotels and all-inclusive resorts and things, you know, you could just get on Travelocity and say, hey, we're going to Capernaum and uh, go ahead and book us a room, you know. So it wasn't like that. They had two options, pretty much. They could either stay at an inn, like, you know, Mary and Joseph were looking for an inn, or they could depend on the hospitality of strangers. And of the two choices, the second one's better. Staying at an inn was not not a good option most of the time. The inns were not a very moral place to stay. Um, it was also, okay, it wasn't a very family-friendly environment, we'll say that. So they staying in an inn, yeah, not the best option. Staying with a family was a much better choice. So Jesus is saying, when you go into the town, he said, find someone who's worthy and stay with them. Uh, and worthy, I think he means in the sense of Okay, they're, they're going in and they're sharing their message, doing the miracles. Um, and, I, and I think the idea is that somebody there is going to latch on to that message. They're going to receive that message. And they're going to say, you know, they're going to see it for what it is and say, man, this Jesus you're talking about, I want to know more about this guy. You got any place to stay? Well, won't you come stay with me? You know, and you could kind of see how, you know, someone who would, latch onto that message might say, hey, you know, won't you come, won't you come stay with me? And that was really the goal. So um, he says, he goes on to say, um, as you enter the house, greet it. And it really means sharing your peace with it. Um, not with the house, of course. Um, <laughs> he's not wishing a blessing on the shingles and the roof and <laughs> the doors and the windows, but it's more about the people in the house. Okay. So let your blessing, your peace, let it come upon the people who live there. And uh, it says, if it's not worthy, he said, let your peace return to you. Um, so you get this idea that, okay, they have a message to share. Actually, it's more than a message. They're sharing a person. Okay, they're sharing the person of Jesus, who is peace with the people. And to the degree that people will receive it, that is awesome. Okay, we never run out of that peace to share. Okay, we have peace. Uh, if you were here for CT this morning, uh, Shane talked about peace, peace of God, peace with God. Uh, we, as Christians, hopefully are enjoying both of those, um, but we have peace, and so when we share it with others, we don't lose what we have. Okay, it's only, it's a benefit to them, and it does not hurt us at all. Um, so Jesus says, listen, if they receive the peace that you offer, great. Stay there until you depart. But if, if they don't receive your peace, just let your peace return to you. And so he says, uh, if, if they won't receive you or listen to your words, shake the dust off from your feet when you leave that house or town. So um, if you've been, you know, to the beach, you know, we were at the beach recently. And, you know, when you come back from the beach and you got all that sand in your, your Crocs and sandals and things, and you get up to the, uh, to the road or the parking lot or whatever, and they have those little places where you can kind of take your shoes off and rinse your feet because you don't want that sand following you home and in your car and in your shower and all those places. You know, you're trying to get that, get that sand off. You're going to leave it where it belongs. Um, well, in Jesus' day, the Jews had a similar practice, uh, but it wasn't because they were going to the beach. It was because they were traveling. It would happen when they were traveling through Gentile country. And remember, Gentiles were looked down upon. They were sinners, dogs. I mean, they were just filthy Gentile people. That's kind of the, the view. 
And so when they would travel through Gentile country and they'd get out, they'd take their shoes off and kind of shake them out like as if to create a separation and say, well, I don't want any of that sticking to me, you know, the, the judgment that's coming upon them for being sinners. Like, I don't want any of that sticking to me. So we're going to let them have their dirt back. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea here. It's creating a separation. Um, and it, it might seem kind of cheesy, but it actually is alluding to a very serious thing. Uh, and Jesus says it here. He said, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Uh, now we all remember from the Old Testament what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness and immorality. God rained down fire and brimstone and burned that city like to the ground. Um, that's pretty bad. But um, Jesus is saying it's going to be worse for those who do not accept the message of salvation. And so that's a big deal. Uh, when we think about the severity of that, man, you know, all of us are called to account for what we do with Jesus. Now, some people have never heard the name of Jesus before. Um, but they're also accountable. The book of Romans chapter 1 talks about that. Um, but the the punishment for someone who only has the creation to look at and and denies God is not like the one who has the truth like has the word of God has the gospel has the message of Jesus and rejects it you know we've all been given a little different light level so to speak and whatever that light level is we're called to respond to that um, and so without Jesus Without responding to the message of Jesus, it is not going to be pretty. Uh, and he wants us to know that. He wants us to know that. It's catastrophic to reject the truth. Well, as we close there, that's about as far as we're going to get for today. A couple of things kind of stand out to me from so far from this chapter. And, you know, the first one is, you know, this idea of callings. Okay, people talk about calling, you know, so-and-so is called to this or called to this ministry or called to that ministry. And we see God call uh, Samuel, or call David, or call Abraham out of his land, or, you know, call in the 12. Um, the, my question for you today is, do you know what calling you're part of? Do you know what God has called you to do? Because all of us have a calling, okay? Every one of us has a calling, a purpose that God has put us here for, and do you know how you fit into that calling? Um, what, what part do you play? Um, how has God gifted or equipped you uh, individually to, to take part in that. Because okay? none of us is a one-man band. I mean, we can't, none of us just by ourselves can just do the whole thing. Okay? It takes the whole body of Christ. But each of us fit into that plan somewhere. Uh, you know, I said it's primarily a teaching ministry, but it, it takes teachers, it takes people serving, it takes people giving, it takes people, uh, you know, all sorts of different things uh, to participate in that calling. And so my uh, question for you is, what part do you play? And if you're not sure what part you play, or you're not sure that what your calling is, uh, I would ask you this. Have you, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? Because I think when we consider what's going on here with these guys, it's in response to prayer that they really were able to lay hold of the calling that God had for them. And so I believe that he will make it clear. So I think praying about it is a great opportunity. Uh, but be ready if you pray. Be ready to hear that he might want to get you involved in some, some way, shape, or form. I think that's uh, to be expected. So anyway, let's pray about it. Uh, let's actually close with a word of prayer today. Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness, for your love, for the message of the gospel, um, for your love that was poured out for us on the cross. Thank you so much for that, for calling us into your family, causing us to be your child, for giving us heaven as our home. Lord, none of these things we deserve, and yet you gave them uh, to us freely at a great personal cost to you. We just thank you so much for it. 
Thank you for this body of Grace Bible Church today. Thank you for everyone who uh, has chosen to be a part here today and to worship with us. Uh, We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.